So we are going to be continuing uh, this week in our series in the book of John. Ser our series theme is titled, That You May Believe, and it's taken from John 20, verse 31, which says, But these are written, that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Uh, this morning we'll be continuing, we'll be in John chapter 6, and we'll be reading from there in a minute. But before we get started, let's, let's have a word of prayer. Grace, Heavenly Father, Lord, we come to you this morning grateful for another chance to, to meet here together, Lord, to worship you. God, I just pray that this morning that the, the words that you give me, God, that you, it would be your message and not mine, that'd be you speaking through me. Lord, I pray that you'd prepare the hearts and minds of those here, uh, that they may receive it and may understand it. For all these things in your son's name, amen. So, have you ever been to... Uh, been to one of those places that you knew ahead of time would be incredible, and it's still when you got there, it just completely blew away all your expectations. Like, you get this idea in your head of what it's going to be like when you get there, but you realize that it's still even more impressive than what you had it built up in your mind. I mean, you know it's going to be big, you try to picture it, but you just aren't fully able to comprehend how big or amazing it is until you see it for yourself. I've got a couple of examples of those types of places this morning. Uh, the first one, you guys most of you guys, I'm sure, recognize this as the Grand Canyon. It's just one of those places that until you see it for yourself, you don't understand just exactly how grand it is. Uh, the next one, you might recognize that, Machu Picchu. Has anybody been there? Anybody here been there? Okay, I haven't either, so. But I imagine it's pretty incredible when you get there. Um, next one is another place I still have yet to go, but... Uh, Mount Everest, another, yet another place is just absolutely immense and you can't fully understand or appreciate the scope of it until you see it for yourself. And we have Mount Rushmore. How many of you have been to Mount Rushmore? Raise your hand. Okay. It's impressive. You see it on the postcards and I'm getting feedback. You see it on the postcards and you see it in the, the textbooks and stuff, but when you see it up, up close for yourself, you realize that it is a whole lot bigger than what you would imagine. And that one, Niagara Falls. Who's been to Niagara Falls? Yeah. I was a little kid when I went. All I just remember was there's a lot of water. I wasn't wrong, but that's all I remember. But pictures never do these places justice. They don't even come close to encompassing the experience of seeing them in person. Because the only way to truly appreciate the magnitude of these sites is you have to experience them for yourself. Now you can understand the concept that they are big and incredible, but without seeing them or experiencing them in person, you just don't truly, you don't truly know, you don't truly understand. And the truth is you want to be blown away when you go to these places. You want to be overwhelmed by the experience. You don't want to go there and see it and be like, yeah, that's, that's what I thought. That's, that's, that's how I pictured it. Like, how disappointing would it be if you traveled halfway across the country to get to the Grand Canyon and you go, yeah, meets expectations. That's what I thought. That's a wasted trip. There's nothing else around there to go to see, so. Now, it's not just with sightseeing. There are all sorts of things in life that cannot be fully understood without experiencing them for yourself. Uh, being a parent is a good example. Nothing fully prepares you for having kids except actually having them. You know, all of the books, all of the babysitting, all of the CPR classes, the advice, none of it fully prepares you for the experience of having kids until you're raising them yourself. And that's okay. We're all designed the same way, and a large part of the joy that we have comes from the newness of these experiences. So for us, without truly experiencing ourselves, our understanding is limited. And we see the same limited understanding in today's passage in John chapter 6. Uh, this is a story that most, if not all of us, are pretty familiar with. Of all of Jesus' miracles, the feeding of the 5,000 is the only one that's recorded in all four Gospels. Which tells us this miracle had a big impact or was a big part of Jesus' ministry and had a big impact on his disciples. There's no doubt that with as many people as were involved in this event, that the story of what happened quickly reached every corner of the country. 
But when we read the story and we see the reaction of the people had to what Jesus had done, we see a people with very little understanding of who he really was. You know, the scope of all their hopes and plans for Jesus were limited to their current situation with no ability to grasp the master plan that God was working out through him. So let's start reading. We're going to read just right there at verse 1, chapter 6. It says, Sometime after this, Jesus crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee, that is the Sea of Tiberias, and a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the signs he had performed by healing the sick. Then Jesus went up on a mountainside and sat down with his disciples. The Jewish Passover festival was near. So we don't know how much time has passed since the healing of the man on the Sabbath in chapter 5. Um, it could have been days, it could have been weeks or even months since that happened, uh, that Jesus crosses the Sea of Galilee. And it's likely that Jesus' crossing was because of some of the mounting opposition to him in Jerusalem. Um, though we'll see in a minute that he doesn't stay there all that long. But Jesus may have decided that he needed to remove himself from that situation for a bit. We also read in some of the other accounts of this story that Jesus had recently learned of John the Baptist's death. And he was looking for some solitude. But whatever the reason for him being there, we see that a large group of people had found out where he was going and had followed him. And John makes it really clear as to why they were there. He says, uh, he says that they followed him because they had seen him healing the sick. They weren't real disciples. They weren't there for his teaching. They were there for the, for the show, for the miracles. They, were, you know, they had heard about his healings, and they were curiously hoping to get a chance to see a miracle or two themselves. And I was listening to a sermon podcast on this story, and uh, the pastor had a quote that I thought was pretty spot on. He said that, Jesus knew that you can build a crowd with miracles, but you cannot build a church. You know, throughout the Gospels, Jesus often drew a crowd with the signs and wonders he performed, but then many of them wouldn't stick around after hearing about his teaching of him being the Son of God. Well, let's continue on reading. It says, When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, Where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. Philip answered him, It would take more than half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Here's a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish. But how far will they go among so many? Jesus said, Have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place, and they sat down. About 5,000 men were there. Jesus then took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. So Jesus sees the people, and he realizes that this crowd is going to need something to eat. And so he decides to test his disciples, and he poses this question of food to them to see what their response would be. And Philip's answer is really pragmatic and calculated. He said it would take more than half a year's wages to even give everybody a single bite to eat. And then Andrew, Andrew speaks up. Of course it would be Andrew. Andrew speaks up and brings a little boy with his lunch uh, that he had brought with him. Five barley loaves and two fish. Now that's not a fancy meal at all. You know, barley uh, is a cheap ingredient to make bread with. Um, and they were probably more along the size of dinner rolls than they were actual loaves. And the fish that he had were probably some kind of preserved fish or even possibly pickled fish. So that sounds very appetizing. But Andrew brings this boy to Jesus, knowing that Jesus could possibly do something. But even Andrew sounds a little bit skeptical. He's on the right track. You know, he recognizes that Jesus is capable of doing something, but he kind of hedges his bet just in case he's wrong. Now, if you know Andrew, Andrew was the first disciple to follow after Jesus. He was originally a disciple of John the Baptist, and then when he heard about John's teaching about who Jesus was, he left him and went to follow Jesus and then when he found Jesus, he left and then went and grabbed his brother and brought his brother with him. So, of course, it would be Andrew would be the one to think to bring this boy to Jesus, believing that Jesus could do something. But I kind of picture him standing there saying something like, Hey, Jesus, hey, hey we found this food, and you know, I realize it's not much, uh, but you know, maybe it's a start or you could do something with it. I just thought, I don't know, maybe, you know do what you want, Jesus, but you know, this is what I found. I think Andrew knew, but he just didn't want to presume too much and, you know, just say, hey, Jesus, here, do something with this. 
But Jesus takes what is offered, and with it, he feeds everyone that is seated there. It says 5,000 men, and then on top of that, there's women and children as well. You know, the number of people could have been over 10,000 for all we know. But all those people fed from just a few loaves of bread and some fish. I mean, could you imagine what Jesus could have done with one of Kevin Terry's briskets that he does? Can you imagine how, what he could have, how he could have multiplied that? Anyways, let's keep reading. It said, when they had all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, gather the pieces that are left over, let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled them, and they gathered them and filled 12 baskets with the pieces of the five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. After the people saw the sign Jesus performed, they began to say, surely this is the prophet who has come into the world. Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. So then after everyone's eaten, all these leftovers collected, the crowd begins to come to life. The people have just been fed a free meal in a miraculous fashion, and now they're talking about what to do next. Now they recognize that Jesus had power that evidently must have come from God. And if that's the case, then they should do something about it. They recognize that he's something special. They think maybe he's the prophet that Moses talked about in Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 15. Moses says this. He says, the, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you. From your fellow Israelites, you must listen to him. So they think that's who Jesus is, and they're not wrong. Uh, Peter talks about this in Acts chapter 3, verse 22 and 23. He says, For Moses said, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people. You must listen to everything he tells you, and anyone who does not listen to him will be completely cut off from their people. So they recognize that he's the one Moses prophesied about, and they realize that he's something important. But then their idea as to where to go from there is all wrong. They wanted to make him king. This guy fed us lunch, and so he must be something special. We need to make him our king. Maybe then he can rid us of the Romans, and we can be an independent nation again. That would solve all of our problems. And like all of us today, they were limited by their own short-sighted understanding. They recognized Jesus as someone of power and importance and that his power came from God. But their plan, their idea for him was, what was, was limited to what was right in front of them. Sure, making Jesus king and having him rule over them would solve their immediate problems. But like always, God's plan is so far beyond what we are able to understand. We only see what is in front of us, what we know. And here in this passage, they weren't going to wait for Jesus to tell them what, they, what to do. Their plan was to make him king by force. They were responding here to his miracles and his signs, but not his message. They didn't understand that Jesus was so much more than a prophet. Yet Jesus had just left Jerusalem where the Jewish leaders called him a heretic and wanted, to, wanted him killed to go to the other side of the Sea of Galilee where now thousands are calling him a prophet and want to make him their king. The nearsightedness of the people made them incapable of understanding exactly who Jesus is. Even those that praised him still fell short in grasping who he was and what his purpose was here on earth. If we'll continue reading, starting in verse 16. Let's say, we'll see. When evening came, his disciples went down to the lake where they got into a boat and set off across the lake for Capernaum. By now it was dark and Jesus had not yet joined them. A strong wind was blowing and the waters grew rough. When they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus approaching the boat, walking on the water, and they were frightened. But he said to them, It is I, don't be afraid. Then they were willing to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat reached the shore where they were heading. So we get to the evening, and the disciples were in the boat without Jesus. In Matthew and Mark, the, their account of this story, it tells us that, that Jesus told the disciples to go into the boat without them, while he dismissed the crowds and went, to the mountain, went up on the mountain to pray. It's possible that he wanted the people to see the disciples leave him there so that later when, they, when he crossed, they wouldn't realize where he had gone. And it's possible that Jesus was trying to shake off this mob of fair-weather fans. But it says that the water was getting rough and the wind had picked up. 
And they were three or four miles out to sea when they saw Jesus coming, when they saw him walking on the water, and they were terrified. Now, they didn't recognize him because they didn't expect him to be there. But then when they hear him speak, they realize it's Jesus, and they invite him into the boat. And then Jesus finishes this miracle triathlon of the day because it says once he stepped into the boat, they were immediately at their destination. Three big miracles in one day, three grand displays of Jesus' power and authority. Um, Matthew and Mark both record Jesus walking, walking on water, um, though John is the only gospel that includes the detail about them immediately reaching their destination. The book of Matthew also tells us this is the same story where Peter gets out of the boat to walk towards Jesus, though neither Mark nor John include that portion of the story. We're not sure why. It could be because they didn't think it important enough to add or that adding that uh, portion to the story they thought might take away the focus off of what Jesus was doing and place it on Peter. But either way, um, either way, when Jesus comes to them in the boat, he's not just walking a short distance from shore. He's already completed some water walking 5K before he ever gets to where they're at. You know, you read that, that, that chapter and you think, man, what a cool day to be a disciple. How awesome would it be to witness those three miracles? I mean, if, if you could pick one day to be a disciple, I feel like this one would definitely have an argument for, for the one to choose. And the feeding of the 5,000 or the water walking alone would be amazing enough, to, but to see them both together would be pretty incredible. An incredible display of Jesus' power. But I was reading the different accounts of this story from the other Gospels, and, and something in Mark stuck out to me. Um, and I thought it was really interesting and sheds a new light on what was happening and why. In Mark chapter 6, verse 51 and 52, it says this. It says, Then he climbed into the boat with them, and the wind died down. They were completely amazed, for they had not understood about the loaves. Their hearts were hardened. This passage paints the disciples in a different light with the feeding of the 5,000 miracle. It wasn't just the people who didn't fully understand who Jesus was. His disciples hadn't fully formed their opinions either. They were there that day and saw Jesus feed all the people, and even they weren't totally convinced yet as to who Jesus was. It's, it's possible that maybe even some of them agreed with the people that they should make Jesus their king. The word here that Mark uses for, uh, for understand in the Greek is a word that means to come to a conclusion. And then the word he uses for harden means kind of a lack of dexterity. In other words, the disciples were having a hard time coming to terms with what they, had, what they had seen. They weren't sure what exactly they believed about Jesus yet. Was he a prophet? A miracle worker? Or was he something more? Was he truly the Son of God? In Matthew 14, 33, it lets us know that after seeing this miracle of Jesus on the water and the wind and the waves calming in his presence, they believed who he was. It says, Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. It's hard to imagine the disciples still doubting who Jesus was up to this point. It's hard to picture anyone who had seen all that they were seeing and who is that close to Jesus still struggling to come to terms with who he really is? Honestly, it makes me feel a little bit better about the times when I have doubts. Here the disciples were with Jesus and they were still struggling to figure out what they believed. And Jesus didn't punish them for this. Instead, he showed them yet another display of his power to make it very clear to them who he was. He was more than a prophet. He was more than just a messenger sent to perform signs and miracles. He came to do the will of God and to fulfill his plan. And we are so thankful that God's plans are not limited to the here and now, but that his plans encompass the past, the present, and all of eternity. Isaiah 55, verses 8 and 9 says this. It says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. We don't always understand what God is trying to do. Our ability to understand is based on our own finite understanding of the tiny corner of this earth that we live in for the short amount of time we are here. And the God that we believe in, 
the God that we know sees all eternity stretched out before him in an instant. It's not a bad thing that we don't always know what he's doing or how he's working. In fact, I don't know that I would want to trust a God that I was fully able to comprehend. We're flawed beings plagued by our own sinful nature and selfish desires. We are consumed with our own struggles and the hardships that we face every day. You know, if we look at the story of Job in the Bible, at the end of the book, Job has a conversation back and forth with God. And Job's angry with God, and he demands from God a reason for why he had let him suffer so much. Job believes that he deserves an explanation. And then when God answers him, he answers him by asking him questions. He asks him, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Were you the one who placed the stars in the sky? Was it you that told the waters of the deep where they, could, where they were to reside? And God continues on and on with these questions, making it clear and clear that Job couldn't fully understand God's ways and God's reasons. And then Job's response at the end is complete humility. He says something along the lines of, basically he says, I have spoken of things I do not know and cannot possibly understand. I'll stop talking now. Now, I read this passage this week, and I was trying to come up with a neat little three-point sermon from the story. You know, and we're all really familiar with the story, and we've heard messages on it before. But I just kept coming back to one main thought. Thank God that he is far greater than we are capable of comprehending. Thank God that his plans are not as short-sighted as our own. Thank God that he is in control of all things. And that from the beginning of, the t- beginning of time, he's been working out his perfect plan. Thank God that even though, he, even though we are flawed and self-centered and full of doubt, he still loved us enough to send Jesus to this earth to show us mercy and grace. Now, I know there's, there's so much more that we can pull from these passages. It's a huge moment in Jesus' ministry. But these last two weeks that I've spent digging into these two chapters of John, the thing that really sticks out is all the people that were there when Jesus was performing his ministry and was performing miracles, they still didn't realize exactly who he was. And we go from those in direct opposition claiming him to be a heretic to those who were drawn to him because of his miracles thinking he was just simply a prophet. And then his own disciples, his closest companions who still struggled to grasp what Jesus' claims were about himself and what that truly meant. And they wrestled with their own doubts. And thank God he didn't give up on us. Thank you, Jesus, for not throwing up your hands in the air and saying, you know what, I'm done with this. You people just simply do not get it, and I'm not wasting any more of my time. And thank you, God, for revealing your son, far greater than any prophet to us, and for sending him as the sacrifice for our sins and the source of our salvation. Thank you, God, for your patience in our times of unbelief and for the mercy that we do not deserve. We serve a loving, patient, and understanding God. In light of what we read in Mark, it makes makes much more sense now why Jesus chose to walk out to his disciples on the water. He wasn't doing it because it was the fastest and most convenient form of transportation. As we saw in John, Jesus could have simply just met them on the other side of the sea if that was his sole intention. But rather, Jesus understood his disciples and they still did not completely understand or hadn't been able to fully grasp who he was yet, and they needed another display of his power. Mark tells in his account that Jesus meant to pass by them. He meant for them to see that he was more than just a prophet, that he was the Son of God who commanded even the winds and the waves of the sea. He was the Savior that God had promised who would save us from our sins. He wanted his disciples to know that. And so he showed them yet another display of his power to help them understand for themselves. He wanted them to know and he wants us to know. He wants us to know who he is and why he came here. We are so blessed to be able to have the completed story so that we can truly know and believe who Jesus is and what he came to do. Because he wants us to believe so that we might be saved as well. Let's pray. Dear Grace Heavenly Father, God, we're just so grateful, God, for your patience when we fail to understand, for your patience when we doubt. God, we're so grateful that you've not given up on us, 
that you loved us so much that you sent your son to die for us. And that through him we might have life for eternity with you. God, we just praise you and we thank you. It's your son's name we pray. Amen.